Great. Good morning. Thanks for being here today. Uh, today I get the, an honor to talk uh, and introduce a little bit to about uh, Hassan Alam. Uh, it's, it's, it's been such an interesting journey for the both of us. Well, we've become close friends uh, since about our acquaintance. What is it, 14 years ago? Yeah. About 14 years ago. Uh, Dr. Lum, as you can see here on his title side, is a professor of surgery at uh, Mass General Hospital. It's a small hospital on the East Coast uh, in Boston. Uh, and I think it's an Ivy League school, Harvard, Harvard Medical School. And uh, it's quite fascinating you know, to see his career rocket the way it did in the last decade or so. <clears throat> Dr. Alam, I've, I met him when he was a surgical resident at the Washington Hospital Center, and I had just started my first job at that time period. And uh, he had rotated through a trauma program, and he was uh, such an intellect at that time period that he thought that he would wanted to go into surgical oncology. And uh, it just so turned out that uh, after his graduation, um, he, uh, we got a chance to work with him and <clears throat> came into our laboratory as a postdoctoral fellow <clears throat> and uh, uh, we got a start at that time period. So we've been doing a lot of research together. We've published uh, uh, probably over 50 papers together, I would say at least. And uh, Dr. Lam is obviously now in, uh, in Mass General now for a very long period of time. It's already been almost six, seven years. Yeah. Wow, seven years. Things have gone fast for him and uh, helped his application into the uh, professorship at um, Mass General. He's in uh, uh, American Surgical Association. He's in, I think he was one of probably the youngest um, member of the SUS, and now he's actually the membership committee. So, you know, we're actually seeing who here wants to join SUS for free this year. Uh, as he said, that uh, he's going to waive all application fees. Uh, <laughs> only if they come from the University of Arizona. <clears throat> he, he's extremely accomplished. He probably, he's got 10 grants ongoing right now, which he's a PI of five. Uh, you know, we all have our troubles, but Dr. Alam's troubles is trying to get his expenditure up to the degree that it needs to be in order to spend his money from his grants. So he's got the trouble of having too much money, as, uh, as we say. But he's got probably about 135 publications at this time, 17 book chapters. He's uh, on every known committee and, and uh, assignment in the nation. He's uh, nationally and internationally renowned. Uh, he has helped revolutionize medicine all around the entire world as uh, the change in resuscitation uh, occurred as a lot of his, uh, his publications, if not all. He's also, we worked very closely together with a suspended animation model. I think uh, uh, the first time I showed him how to cool a pig down and, and bring it back, he, I can only imagine what was going through his mind as we try to do some of those endeavors. But uh, it's really a great honor to have him here today to present us uh, with his work. I'd say much more than his uh, talk, which is always a, a fantastic talk that he'll give, um, but it's to, just to take a look at his career path and see uh, how well a person can do, how fast they can do uh, if you put your mind to it. But I, I, he also has some uh, innate abilities that uh, a lot of us may not have. I remember when I first met him and he was working in our lab, he came in and he was carrying around this textbook of, of uh, of a history of a war. I don't even know which war that was at that time period. And it was like, who could read this thing? And, and he would read a book like that in about a day. So he has an in, in, uh, enormous amount of capability for learning and, and processing this out. But he's very clinically relevant, and it's an honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Alam. Well, thank you very much. And it's. Uh, you know, when you start going around and giving talks, uh, they all kind of start to blend uh, together. This is especially uh, unique because of Peter. So I bring you uh, greetings from the beautiful but cold city of Boston. Uh, and what I'll talk about is it's not just sort of giving a lecture about resuscitation. You know, it's a teaching program. We've got resident students. I thought I'll take three or four or five ideas that started as totally crazy ideas, how they evolved and how they uh, became clinically relevant. And there's a story behind each and every one of those ideas, and, and there's some lessons learned that I learned over the last 10 years. And it's all about sort of uh, creating a change, uh, how to capitalize on, on chances, opportunities, mentorship, uh, developing collaborations, uh, and not taking no for an answer. It's so like, you know, why is a guy from Boston talking about change? 
But this was, this was uh, MGH on the left-hand side and the Harvard Medical School on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, 200 years ago, this is the Harvard Medical School now. And this is, and you see the old MGH building right there. And they have, this whole thing is taken over, and this is 2000. So now that this place, this jail is now a huge building. This is a huge building. It's like a cancer that's growing. So even in Boston, you can create change. But before Boston was useless, uh, that's where I met Peter. So uh, the story started um, in 1999 uh, 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 the Uniform Services University. And we'll go through some of these stories, and you'll see a common theme emerging. I don't know about you guys have uh, read this book uh, by Malcolm Gladwell. I, I picked it up at the airport uh, traveling. And it's, it's fascinating. It's a little sort of cheesy for, for uh, uh, mass market consumption, but there, there's, a, there's a true message there. When I mean, you can have talent, you can work hard, uh, but the secret ingredient to success is that you have to have an opportunity. And some people capitalize on it, some don't capitalize on it. Um, often enough, you just sort of pass it by. But it's a matter of seizing that opportunity and, and making something out of it. So as Peter was saying, so June 1999, I was uh, finishing my fellowship, and we were sitting at a dinner table. He goes, what are you doing next month? I said, well, I'm just going back home. And I said, why don't you come and work with me at UCIS? I said, oh, that's a crazy idea. Uh, but I did. And, and I think this was, again, uh, an opportunity presenting itself and you taking uh, um, advantage of it. That was probably the best decision I made um, in my academic career. So we got 50 or so papers out of it, uh, three or four grants worth about $5 million. We got a patent that got commercialized. But the next three, four years, the biggest thing that I learned was how to, um, how to be academically successful. And it's a learned trait. It's not sort of something that just happens by chance. And when we go through the talk, you'll see the ideas and the concepts, and then you'll see uh, where they started. Talking about chances and opportunities. Um, so 1999, I went to UCIS. I did a postdoc, you know, year of postdoc fellowship. Peter was deployed. Um, he was on a ship and then a Balboa. Uh, we had a grant at that time looking at fluid resuscitation. Uh, and September 11th happened. Uh, a few months later, uh, sitting in my office and uh, guy from Office of Naval Research, Mike Gibbon, who's funded me now for 12 years, he calls and says, like, you know, things have changed. Um, we still have the same gauze that we've been using for the last, you know, God knows for how long since the Roman legions walked the earth. And we're going to deploy it. Can we come up with a better hemostatic dressing? Now, we were not working in hemostasis. We had never worked on it. There were no models. We had a funded grant looking at resuscitation fluids. I said, Mike, when do you want to get this thing done? He goes, uh, how about now? I mean, we're going to deploy. I mean, we need it now. Now, you can do one of two things. So, well, you know, we don't, we're not set up for that. We don't have the fellows. We don't have a model. I mean, we had nothing. We didn't even know where to start. I said, well, we can give it a try. And I was uh, stupid enough and naive enough and say, oh, yeah, sure, we can try. Oh, I, don't, I don't even think I said that. I said, like, yeah, sure, we'll do it. The first thing was, how do you create a model, and what are you going to use? Uh, and, and they really needed it right away. So we, uh, uh, we started creating all these injuries. Uh, the first time when we took a, I'll show you the clip, I mean, we took a uh, <coughs> saw and cut the leg off a pig, and they still didn't bleed to death. And, and there were all these agents that were out there, a little fibrin product and this and that, and we were looking for something that's going to work in massively bleeding uh, uh, wounds. This is a model that we created. You'll see on the left-hand side is the, uh, uh, just to orient you, the, the leg is up there, the body is, and this is the groin. We just said, okay, well, we create an injury that's high enough that you can't put a tourniquet, um, big enough that it'll bleed you, uh, to death, but it's still fixable. So we just, you know, essentially just took a knife and just, just cut the femoral artery, femoral vein, all the way, all the muscles. And this is one minute out to see a big nice created this big audible bleach and say in this model I've done good. keep it away from the you don't it so I mean we needed something that will make this bleeding stop uh, and we started looking all over the place uh, we asked the vendors to come in and bring in whatever they had and so this company uh, that was making uh, this zeolite for salvaging uh, water out of refrigeration units so you know it's it's a min it's, it looks like kitty litter 
in the refrigeration unit, you've got all this condensation in the water. So you put it in there, it just soaks up water. So what about this thing? So has it been tested in a biological system? No. Well, the, well, we're not going to lose anything. Throw it in. And, and lo and behold, I mean, it, it worked like magic. Um, uh, we tested it against some other products like zeolite, uh, zeolite against chitosan, uh, Hemcon, it worked. Uh, Institute of Surgical Research tested in the liver injury model, it worked. It created a lot of heat. Um, it works by sucking up the, the water into, it's, a, it's not a chemical reaction, it's a, it's a total physical thing. It's a molecular sieve, and it takes up water and generates a fair amount of heat. Um, and that led to sort of modification of these things. Um, we packed it in a tea bag uh, so it doesn't come in contact with the, uh, with the tissues. Uh, the composition of it got changed as we went along. But the initial thing actually was fairly successful. It took three months. Uh, November we started, we worked pretty much day and night, um, hired a couple of research fellows to give us some extra <coughs> funding. So while it's gonna take six months for the money to come, so don't worry about it, we have money for something else, we're gonna go ahead and start doing it. Uh, within three months we had an FDA approval of 510K. The same summer, summer of 2002, uh, the special ops people were using it in, in, uh, uh, in Afghanistan. And in 2003, it got deployed. I mean, it is amazing how rapidly it went from a crazy idea, refrigeration unit, zeolite, to FDA approval, to clinical uh, practice. And then all these modifications took place later. It got so much coverage. I mean, we had only done it in 36 pigs. It was in New York Times. That's the only thing that my parents read, actually. They've never read any of my papers. They were excited about that. And then the onslaught. I mean, it's Fox News. It was you know, Los Angeles Times, uh, Times Magazine. Uh, it just kept on going. Like, you know, a, a Wall Street Journal, a business we thought you should buy stocks in this thing. But what came out of it, which was a very practical thing, is the, uh, the individual first aid um, uh, thing that the Marines were carrying, it, it got changed for the first time in the longest period of time. And they added this quick clot into it. Um, and it was deployed. And again, if you think about it in, in practical terms, I think the war has got a way of, uh, of rapidly accelerating some of these transformations that have went from a 36-pig study, never tested in humans, to wide uh, deployment. And then these testimonials started coming in. Um, you know, people were using it. Only Navy had uh, deployed it, but some of the Army people were probably getting it as well. And they were putting it in all kinds of different things. Uh, we didn't have any data Then Peter gathered this data in 2008 and published it. Most of it is, is battlefield data, some of it is civilian data. And again, it's, it is an improvement on the conventional gauze. It wasn't perfect, it was messy, uh, uh, it created heat, uh, but, but it was an improvement on, on what we had. But again, it's, it's, it's uh, an example of a need coming up with an idea that's novel, uh, doing it rapidly, and, and transforming it from just a benchtop thing uh, to clinical practice. Uh, again, the other thing was how the, the, the media caught on to this. It was in Doonesbury. Uh, they wanted to put the quick clot in it. Uh, and then, I don't know if you guys seen it. I think some of you have the clips for this thing. Let's see if this thing works or not. But, but you know, it, 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 I was just watching the movie. Yeah, and it's this can't be true. Right on time, like it's supposed to. Before I shot him again. Yeah, well, he's been hit twice on this. He can stop the bleeding without going to the hospital or a doctor. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to find him lying dead by a dumpster in an in 20 minutes. <laughs> Now he gets shot. <laughs> Pulls out the quick clock. Yeah, it burns. <laughs> And this is what we've been teaching people not to do. I mean, this is not going to control internal bleeding. It's just burning the skin. <laughs> but again, I mean, the, the, the take home message is, I mean, this thing had never, by this time, I mean, it was still a totally sort of relatively untested thing. But it, again, went from clinical use to mass media, uh, uh, pop culture, almost instantaneously. Now we've got a newer version of it. We've got the, the combat gauze. Uh, it doesn't generate heat, probably doesn't work as well as impregnated gauze. That's sort of the new thing. But it was a very um, uh, fascinating uh, 
experience. And the things that, that you learn from it, at least personally what I learned, is one, you've got to take risk. Once the opportunity presents itself, you've got to say yes and step up. Uh, most of the people find a reason not to do it. You've got nothing to lose, uh, so you've got to take risk. You've got to think big, and, and you've got to write. I mean, I can't, this is one thing that I tell um, all of our research fellows. Maria was in the, in the lab with us, so she will uh, testify to it. You've got to write. I don't care whether you write grants, you write uh, manuscript, you like, write uh, a blog, but you've got to get into the habit of writing. It's almost like running. It's almost like exercising. The more you do it, the easier it gets. So all of our fellows have writing time. I make sure that every week they sit down and write. You've got to write down, sit down and write from 8 to 12. I don't care how you do it, what you write, but you've got to sit down and write. Otherwise, you can find 15 reasons not to do it. So all these things that we did, we wrote. We wrote you know, 10, 20 papers a year. And you just keep, the, keep on writing about the same thing and keep on getting it out. Written word is the currency of academic promotion. I'll switch gears and talk about some resuscitation stuff. Um, let me share a case with you. This is soon after we got to MGH, and I'm sure you may have cases like that here too. A young guy got shot three times. Buddies dropped him off. He was hypotensive, in shock. Um, multiple gunshot wounds. One was a big one through the pelvis. Uh, these are the initial labs. pH is low, otherwise looks okay. And this is the care he got in the ED. They intubated him, which made his um, hypotension to a near full arrest. When he arrested, they put some groin lines in. They started giving him some IV fluids. They gave him two units of uh, uh, O negative blood. And about this time, so maybe we should call the trauma team, so they called the trauma team as well. <laughs> now, I'll come back to this case. Now, how much can you bleed? I mean, you know, you maintain your blood pressure, and after a while, once you've lost 30, 40 percent, then very rapidly the blood pressure goes down. With the pre-hospital time being relatively short, you're bleeding at a fairly rapid clip uh, in this patient. Now, most of the ones who bleed and bleed to death, you never see them. They go to the morgue. But patients like this who bleed, they don't die, something happens down here. They drop the hydrostatic pressure, a clot generates, a fibrin plug forms, and then gradually the blood pressure gets up if they survive. When we step in, what we do is we push the pressure up, pop the cloud, they bleed again, the pressure goes down, we give them more saline, pressure goes up, they bleed more, and before you know it, you do it a couple of times, then you have Kool-Aid coming out of the patient, uh, you've washed out all the uh, clotting factors, platelet count has gone down, and the hemoglobin has gone down as well. So coming back to our patient, uh, took him to the OR, belly's full of blood, and the uh, resuscitation fluid in the abdomen, the iliac veins were gone, the femoral lines were just pumping into the peritoneal cavity. Uh, we ligated all the stuff, packed the pelvis, and he's making no clot, and high doses of drugs. Got a lot of red cells, got some plasma, got some platelets. If you look at the ratio, probably not as, as contemporary as, as we're doing right now, but continue to bleed. And then the numbers. Initial hemoglobin was okay. We got the first two units, it went up. And then once the coagulopathy kicked in, it's a losing battle. pH got a little bit better with the first round of blood and then went down. Came in non-coagulopathic, became coagulopathic. And then the vicious cycle starts. The peak air pressure go up. We're going up on the peep. He's bleeding from everywhere. The IV sites start bleeding. The ET tube has got blood in it. Four hours later, we called it off. Is that avoidable or not? And, and we'll look at some of the resuscitation lessons and how we can do it better. This is Don Trunke's sort of classic trimodal distribution of trauma death. The second peak has gone down. The third peak has really gone down. In your ICUs, we were in the ICU yesterday. I mean, nobody really dies in the ICU. You go on a ventilator, you get dialysis. Our ICU mortality rate is single digits, 2 3%. That's where patients continue to die. Um, the, and they die early. I mean, the time to death is not days. It is all fairly early, within the first six hours or so. I think you've seen this CRASH-2 trial, 21,000 patients, 40 different countries. Look at the time of death. The vast majority of the patient, bleeding death and all-cause death was front-loaded. Very rarely, less than 2.5%, and these are developing countries. Patients are dying of multiple organ failure. They're all dying early. They're dying soon after injury, within the first three to six hours, and they're the bleeding to death. Same in the battlefield. This is from, uh, from Vietnam, same data now. And let's look at how we treat these trauma patients. So we have got the pre-hospital phase. We try to keep him alive. We decrease organ injury. Uh, I like what Peter says, like, you know, the best resuscitation fuel, uh, resuscitation fluid in the pre-hospital phase is, is just uh, diesel. I mean, you know, the faster you drive, the better chance they have. 
come down to the ED, you do the ABC. The goal here is if you're going to fix the injuries, that only, this is the only thing that's going to give them a chance to survive. And everything else is a means to that end. And let's look at the tools that we have right now. It's in the pre-hospital phase, you give them a little bit of crystalloid. Once they get to the ED, you give them some blood. And that's pretty much it, if you think about it. And that hasn't changed a whole lot in the last how many years? I mean, since the Second World War, probably. Uh, crystalloids got introduced in the Vietnam era, blood uh, around the Second World War time, towards the end of it. But over the last 30, 40 years, it hasn't really changed a whole lot. Now, we'll talk about um, resuscitation from hemorrhagic shock, and I want to just put a qualifier here. We're not talking about sepsis and septic shock and early goal-directed resuscitation and septic shock is very well described, but it's a different pathophysiology. Patients who are in septic shock are vasodilated, they're losing th uh, uh, fluid, capillaries are leaking, and trauma patients are bleeding to death. Now, once you stop the bleeding, tra trauma patients do start behaving like septic shock patients, and there is a post-traumatic SIRS, uh, and, and there are a lot of similarities, but early on within the three to six hours where they're all bleeding to death, uh, they're very different entities. The certain things that work, certain things that don't work uh, in these bleeding patients. And this has been looked at before. Pre-hospital resuscitation really doesn't change outcome. Pre-hospital intubation doesn't change outcome. Time to definitive care always helps. Uh, and every time you do the minimum stuff you do pre-hospital, the better chance patient has of surviving. Basic life support, every time it's been looked at, is better than advanced life support in massively bleeding trauma patients. So quick transfer to the hospital, don't waste time, don't do much. And our reliance on crystalloid, kind of certain things make sense. Uh, it restores volume and is dirt cheap. Uh, salt water is really, really cheap. And there's certain bad things about it because it's a really poor substitute for the blood that you're losing. And it worsens bleeding and it has a lot of effects that I'll, I'll quickly show you. This concept of whether aggressive fluid resuscitation is good or bad, it's been addressed multiple times. Uh, there are a lot of preclinical data, for example, this very nice meta-analysis. and in in severe shock, like arrest shock, if you give crystal crystalloids, you can keep him alive for a little longer. It doesn't change the long-term long outcome, but you can keep him alive. But hypotension, moderate shock, where they're hypotensive but not dead, not in full arrest, any animal model, aortic transection, splenic injury, liver injury, early ag aggressive resuscitation hastens death. It's, it's a common theme across all animal models. Let's look at some clinical evidence. And as you can imagine, it's a tough area to generate clinical evidence. There's a Cochrane meta-analysis, and they found six trials and found really no evidence to support early or large volume resuscitation. And I'll just focus on one trial, because there's one big trial, and every, everything else um, is just very small stuff. In this one, now it seems like for a long, long time ago, in 94 it came out, uh, the uh, trial from Bentop Hospital, Bickel, and uh, Ken Maddox group. And it was very controversial then, it's still controversial now, but it's, it's, it's a big study. Prospective randomized, 600 patients, even odd day randomization. On even day, they got IV fluids as standard of care. On odd day, they just got HEPLOC. And the patients who were enrolled were penetrating truncal trauma who were hypotensive. 10% of them had CPR ongoing. Only Ken Maddox can do this study and pull it off for the IRB. I mean, you've got CPR going, you just give them HEPLOC and no fluid. Uh, Taken to the operating room, clamp on the bleeder, and then resuscitate it. So it's not that they were not resuscitated, it's hemorrhage control before resuscitation. And there was an 8% mortality advantage, and it was criticized because some patients who came in dead, stayed dead, were not analyzed in the intent to treat analysis, but even if you throw them in, the point is still the same. Early aggressive resuscitation didn't change out. <laughs> The other concern was that if you hold the fluids back, they're going to have more renal failure, worse organ damage, and that wasn't the case. They left the hospital early, and there was no difference in multiple organ failure. It's the only large prospective randomized trial on this topic. Blunt trauma may be a little different. They have head injury. They're older. They're no surgically correctable source. But even in this patient population, abdominal compartment syndrome, worsening of uh, pulmonary uh, edema, we've seen it all. So now the new buzz thing is the, uh, if you're going to, it's like the Goldilocks, you know, not too hot, not too cold kind of thing, you're going to resuscitate him. Just don't give them as much. And I think that makes sense. And that's being adopted without a whole bunch of clinical data supporting it, but preclinical data supports it. Every time it's been looked at, uh, uh, it makes a difference. I'll tell you another story that Peter and I started working on when we were at, at UCIS, is looking at fluids as drugs. Uh, 
the general concept was that lactated ring or crystalloid is like, you know, mother's milk. I mean, how can it be bad? It's just good for you. The more, the better. Every time I ask the resident how much fluid you will give him, it's like two large bore IV lines. How fast? As fast as I can. And why is that? And then suddenly they start mumbling. It's like, oh, well, isn't that what the ATLS says to do? Uh, it's good for the patient. And so, well, let's think about fluids and what it does. And fluids, it, they do make a difference. This is one of the studies that Peter and I did originally, and this is a large animal model. You give them crystalloids, you activate the neutrophil. And Peter did another study looking at human blood. And in a dose-dependent fashion, you expose the neutrophils, human neutrophils in the circulation, to isotonic crystalloid normal saline lactated ringer. It activates the cells. The cells get angry, start releasing free radicals. Not only the cells get um, uh, activated, they live longer. So these cells that are supposed to die in a few hours then, uh, then linger in the circulation, keep on releasing free radicals, and cause organ damage. You keep on digging deeper, and it doesn't stop. Uh, their machinery is reprogrammed. Uh, the, all the uh, uh, different genes are, are differentially uh, transcribed. And we, again, uh, message to the residents, if you find something and it's working, write a whole lot about it. I mean, we published like 20, 30 papers because you got to get the same message over and over and over and over. One paper doesn't change practice, but series of paper, 20, 30, 40 papers in a short period of time, especially reproduced by other people, then suddenly start having an impact. And we found that fluids are drugs. They affect the cells at every level imaginable. And uh, one of the big culprit was the, the de-isomer of lactate in the lactated ringer. If you eliminate that, uh, it eliminates some of, the, uh, uh, some of the side effects. And again, it became clinically meaningful because based on this data, there was an Institute of Medicine report that came out. Uh, one of the big manufacturer of lactated ringer, Baxter, for example, switched to making L-isomer of lactate only. In Europe, you can't find the, the racemic uh, uh, formulation. It's been completely taken off the market. Once again, a completely crazy idea. Within three or four uh, years, uh, it, it had a big impact on, on what we're giving to the patients. You probably don't even realize that you just reach for a bag, but what's in the bag now is not what used to be in there uh, five years ago. About this time, this whole paradigm of resuscitation was changing. Uh, we had moved away from 20, 30 liters, uh, and we were realizing that we have been focusing for the last 30 years on how to fill the tank that's got a big hole in it. And, and it, one, it's not easy. Second, there's a price to be paid with all the uh, delusional coagulopathy and effect of the fluids. And so how about looking at the other side? Let's just assume that you can't fill the tank. The hole is too big. Eventually, we have to put some stitches in it or do something. How can we keep them alive, keep the cells alive without looking at the delivery side of the equation? Just focus on making them more resilient. DARPA at that time uh, had started this program called Surviving Blood Loss. And DARPA, as you, as you know, they, they've funded all the uh, development of drones and, and high-risk, high-yield, crazy ideas. One liter of fluid weighs one kilogram, 2.2 pounds. Somebody has to carry it on their back. How much fluid can you carry in a pre-hospital environment in a battlefield? So they came up with this program and said, we'll fund you, we'll fund you generously if you can come up with a fluid-less resuscitation protocol that doesn't rely on fluids at all. You just gotta make them survive and give them no fluids. 60% blood loss was the target. You gotta create a model where 60% blood loss has to have about a 90% mortality and you gotta make it into 75, 80% survival and give them no fluids. Now, at first glance, it seems like a crazy thing, but if you step back and think about it, there's a very diverse response to hemorrhage. You look at your trauma patient, you match them for age, gender, comorbid problems. Some of them do poorly, they die. Some of them have all the complication known to men with all the multiple organ failure, all this infectious complication, and some patients do relatively okay. And for the longest period of time, we thought it's in your genes. Now with the Human Genome Project, we know there are only 20,000 genes. It's not a gene there's not an e enough genetic diversity among us to explain these differences. And there's, a, again, a practical point. If it was your, in your genes, I can alter it. But if it's not in your genes, it's how the genes are transcribed, then maybe I can change how you handle shock. And that's indeed the case. There are a lot of innate pro-survival pathways starting at the gene down to the protein level, and they're all susceptible to manipulation. So what we proposed at that time was that we can create a pro-survival phenotype. We'll take a dying situation and turn on the innate pro-survival pathway by giving them a drug and make them survive. One thing I've learned in, in getting funding, the crazier the idea, the more you can ask for money. 
And, and this was no exception. So they gave us millions of dollars and we said, this is, this is how, what we're going to do. Um, they are very uh, tough taskmaster. I mean, every month you got to give them a report, but they fund you very generously. So we did some network biology thing. We looked at all the genes. And um, in a, one of our lab meetings, we sat down and we realized that only about 7% of the genes are altered by shock and resuscitation in a fluid-specific fashion, organ-specific fashion. So well, what is common among all these genes? Why these seven genes and not the other 93% of the genes? And what we realized is that they are genes that are under the control of a certain system. So if you indulge me, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little lesson from your medical school days. Uh, this is your DNA and this is the chromosome. And this DNA is wrapped around these proteins, which are called histones. And it is really compact. If you take a spaghetti from the east coast to the west coast, 3,000 mile long piece of spaghetti, you squish it into a football, that's how tightly it's packed. But at any instance, split second, it can unravel and present a, a, a piece of the DNA that's needed effortlessly. And, and how does that happen is because of these proteins. And depending on the activation status, they control what is transcribed and what's not transcribed. And that's all good to know, but how does it change your management? It does if I can control the activation status of those proteins. And it's controlled by acetylation. It's just like phosphorylation was 20 years ago. You add an acetyl group to these proteins, and depending on where you're adding it, you can change, you can create a conformational change in these proteins and change the DNA transcription. And it's these two groups of enzymes um, that alter the function. And not only they alter how the genes are transcribed, they also activate preformed proteins uh, in the cell. So that the two drugs that we focused on that time, because DARPA was not interested in us developing new drugs over the next 20 years. They, again, just like anything in the military, DJ, you know, they want it now. Like, we need it right now, tomorrow, if possible. So we looked at these two drugs because they were commercially available, FDA approved for other indications. Um, one is valproic acid, approved in 1978. It's generic. You can buy a truckload of it for five bucks. Uh, the other one is Saha, which was approved uh, as a new adjuvant uh, treatment. Uh, more expensive, relatively new, uh, but fairly safe drugs, both of them. And these, both of them, uh, belong to the uh, histone deacetylase inhibitor class that I just showed you, and can, they can change uh, uh, the activation status of the genes and activation of the proteins. And we did a number of studies. And again, you'll see the same theme. Once you get an idea, you've got to publish it and, and publish a fair amount. And we can indeed create a pro-survival phenotype. I'll show you two or three selected studies. This is one of the first DARPA-funded projects that we did. This is a rat model. We bled him 60% uh, blood volume. And the NR is the no resuscitation group, so 75% die. If I give them either Saha or valproic acid and give them no fluid, no fluid whatsoever, 60% blood loss with no resuscitation whatsoever, about 80%, 75-80% live. And that, then we've done a number of studies looking at the why part of it. Uh, and um, it is, if I just go back for a second, the survival advantage is so rapid that it's not at the gene level, as you can see. I mean, within two hours, the genes haven't transcribed. So the effect that we see, this early effect, survival effect, is at the protein level. It just activates the innate pro-survival proteins in the cell. Um, and we've identified a number of these proteins, and I won't bore you with the, with the mechanistic stuff, but pretty much at every level, every survival pathway that you look at, you can activate it as rapidly as within a minute or two by giving them the drugs. Not only you have early effect, but then you can affect angiogenesis later on. Um, you can also prevent distant organ injury. This is a gut schemia reperfusion, but looking at lung injury. So not only it improves survival in the, in the gut schemia with the dead gut, but it also decreases lung injury at a distant site. So overall decrease in inflammation. So um, we took this idea from then the rat small animal model and said, let's just do it in a in few large animal models so we can, as a bridge to clinical trial. And um, this is a study I was actually very happy with because, once again, there was no model that existed of polytrauma, the patient that I showed you. So we created this model. And let's see if this, this comes out uh, or not. But uh, we created, instrumented the animals and said, we're going to really create a polytrauma thing, not just bleed him. In a, from a carotid artery catheter, because that's not what happens in real life. 
we got a creosoft tissue injury, so we had a femur <coughs> fracture, 60% blood loss. Then we kept them in shock for a period of time. Then we give them a whole bunch of saline, just like the medics give you. It makes them cold and coagulopathic. Then we created a large liver injury, grade five liver injury, bled him more. Then we packed the liver, belly open. And after that, we said, we're just gonna give them valproic acid and see whether they live or not. Uh, so they had, they were cold, they're coagulopathic, femur fracture, soft tissue injury, massive blood loss. This is the femur fracture being created. It doesn't look like much, but this is what it does to the femur. Uh, this is a grade five liver injury with this device that uh, uh, John uh, Holcomb had uh, designed at ISR. So really high up in the liver with a big liver crunch. And this is what happens to the acid base status. They're really sick, these animals. So here we've got control animals that just got saline, fresh whole blood, and uh, animals that just got valproic acid. There's no difference in the degree of acidosis. Remember the uh, slide I showed you, we're not looking at the delivery side of the equation. We just, so it made no difference in terms of their resuscitation status, but the animals lived. They were equally shocky. Hemoglobin was down to two. A base deficit was whatever you see here, like in a minus 10, minus 12 acutely. Lactate was about 15 or so. But if we got the drug in, they lived. Um, and and they, they, they lived for as long as we, we watched him. Uh, this is not good. So move on to the, so we, then we created this thing uh, where we uh, uh, did long-term survival study. And the question that was raised is maybe you save them for the first six hours, but maybe they die of some uh, delayed complications. So here we created a liver injury, splenic injury. This is what the liver looked like. We cut you know, half of the liver off. We cut the spleen in three pieces, dropped them back in. We created rib fractures, and um, we treated them just like I showed you. And then we, we watched them. Uh, it's a long-term survival study. Now, valproic acid by itself doesn't have any hemostatic properties, if they were bleeding, they still bled and, and, and died, but we still managed to push the survival up. But the other one, the SDP, and I'll show you a little bit about it, is spray-dried plasma. And that's another very fascinating story. Um, that's up for, uh, uh, I'll come to that in one second. So while we were doing all this stuff, one of our postdocs said, well, if it works in hemorrhage, would it work in septic shock? So why don't you try it? So. We started with some rodent models of septic shock, and it decreases acute lung injury. And even more dramatic, the more lethal the injury, the more dramatic the survival advantage. And that's a fascinating thing about these compounds. In, in uninjured uh, cells, they're not picked up by the cells that much. In the injured cell, they pick it up at 20-fold higher affinity. Um, and then you have a survival advantage. If you have a 30% lethal model, you don't see much effect. But in 100%, 90% lethal model, it has a dramatic effect. We also tested in trauma patients. I got the spleens out from all the trauma splenectomies and look at the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, immunological response. And sure enough, the trauma patients behave just like rats. I mean, you know, they, their, their profile was the same. And we've done some more studies since then looking at what pathways are involved and, and you know, the acute phase reactions and how the different systems are all connected to each other. It decreases the overall systemic inflammation. Uh, but here's the sum total of this concept of pharmacological resuscitation that started with this DARPA challenge. It's like, can you come up with resuscitation in a syringe, if you may? And in multiple models of lethal shock, both septic and hemorrhagic shock, it improves survival. It improves survival dramatically. Uh, and it does it through a number of these mechanisms, decreasing cell death, organ dysfunction, uh, innate, uh, uh, enhancement of the innate survival pathways. Uh, we have now some human in vitro data. Uh, and again, just if you have an idea and you get some positive data, what you do with that is you go back and ask for more money. So we went and got another R01 grant. We got another uh, two more DOD grants, total some total of about $8 million two years ago. Uh, and we went to the FDA and we asked them to approve it. They, we just got a, a approval from FDA for a phase one and phase two clinical trial for this VPA thing. So once again, within five years, it went from a crazy idea funded by DARPA to about a total of about eight or 10, $12 million of, of research funding, probably about 80 manuscripts, and now um, um, an FDA trial. So uh, the final uh, one or two uh, 
quick things that I'll, I'll talk about. The damage control resuscitation, every, everyone is practicing it. Permissive hypotension, don't give as much crystalloids. And that's why I think, you know, our designing new, resus new crystalloids kind of fizzled out because nobody is using crystalloids in a, in a, in a large volume. But this concept of fluid-less resuscitation or drugs, I think logistical advantages are huge. You can put it in somebody's backpack, in the, in the ambulance, you can put it in the pre-hospital environment, you can put it in the battlefield. Uh, the logistical footprint is, is very small. It, I'm going to show you this one guy who was hit by a truck, young, healthy guy in shock. It, it's not to be gruesome, but this pressure, his pressure is 50 right now. You see this big degloving injury, but what is noticeable is there's no bleeding. When your pressure is down to 50, 60, he was mentating just fine. This guy eventually got 28 or 30 units of blood. He had bad pelvic fracture, but this degloving injury, as long as the pressure is low and you give them component therapy early, you can control the bleeding. There is a lot of retrospective data that you guys have seen about um, ratio of component therapy, giving them components, plasma and platelets early. And this is retrospective data. Um, not very strong data, it's been roundly criticized, but it convinced the Surgeon General to come up with a policy decision that everyone in the battlefield who, who bleeds massively should get one is to one is to one ratio uh, component therapy. There is some civilian data, this is from Vanderbilt, that if you come up with a massive transfusion protocol, you don't give them overall more blood products, you give them component therapy early, and what is important here is that unexpected deaths dramatically go down. So there is something to it. Kenji and Abba came up with the same thing about platelets. If you've got to give them components, you've got to give them platelets early. There is now some improving data, and, and uh, I know uh, Dr. Keefe is going to work with the, uh, with the next uh, uh, prospective randomized trial. Hopefully, we'll be able to prove that this concept of early component therapy in high ratios uh, makes a difference in a prospective randomized trial. But I think there is some uh, benefit to it. Generally, in trauma community, people believe now that early plasma red cells and platelet uh, administration is good, but how do you take the blood bank to the pre-hospital environment? I mean, if you're going to give it early, how do you take all the stuff that's refrigerated, requires type and cross match, and put it in an ambulance? As I showed you, I mean, the, the story is, is all pretty much said and done by the time they come to the hospital, especially if the pre-hospital transport times are long. So this is another story of coming up with crazy idea and getting a lot of funding for it. So, it's like, you know, how do we get plasma to the pre-hospital environment? And I remember Peter and I, were sh we shared an office, and he, um, and he goes, like, you know, we just got to, you know, dry it, freeze it. And I said, yeah, I mean, you know, I just had a baby at that time. It's like, you know, you can take milk, which is protein, you make formula out of it, you just put it in a bottle and you shake it. And why can't we do it with the plasma? And, you know, why not? So you can freeze dry it. We freeze dry hormones, we uh, antibiotics. These are all proteins. You add some water to it, reconstitute it, and give it. Why can't we do it for plasma? This technology is old. I mean, it's been around since Second World War. Um, it just fell out of favor with um, uh, viral transmission and pool plasma and, and completely died. But you can do it. You can also combine, once you reconstitute it, with some hemoglobin-based solution. You can put some recombinant factors. And, and if you're really um, aggressive about it and crazy about it, you say, well, instead of putting a liter back, I'll put a little bit of water in. Make a little espresso out of it. You know, like, same amount of caffeine, just a little bit of water. And I mean, finding sterile water in the pre-hospital environment is not that easy, so why not just put just a tiny bit of water? It's got a little oomph to it. And it's all doable. So we asked for funding. We got funded again. Uh, and it, it works. Uh, this is how you... You put it in a tray, expose it to really, really cold temperature, make a powder out of it, and you backpack it just like you do uh, for your coffee, uh, and it can stay on the shelf for 30 years. There was somebody who uh, uh, lyophilized plasma in 1960, and they tested it 30 or 35 years later, and still had about 90% protein uh, function sitting on a shelf, uh, not, not refrigerated. So you can completely transform how you run the blood banking thing, so you don't have to throw it away after a short period of time. As a matter of fact, if you're going to get deployed, you can have your own plasma in your own backpack. You can donate it before. You come back, you don't use it, you can give it to the blood bank. But if you get plasma, you can get your own plasma. When that worked, we said, well, why don't we make it into the espresso thing? So we tried to dissolve it in smaller volumes, and that cake of stuff won't dissolve. 
So then we spray dry it. We just make a little mist out of it and spray dry it. This is how we do it for pharmaceutical um, antibiotics and hormones and all this stuff. So it's really fine powder. And that you can reconstitute in a tiny amount of water. And it was just as good uh, as FFP. Um, so that, all this stuff now is approved by FDA. So um, Marty Schreiber just did a, a phase one trial with the lyophilized thing. We are doing a phase one trial at MGH with the spray dried thing. But the concept works. Once again, a crazy idea. Within two or three years, went through a few studies, and now a clinical trial. I'll, I'll switch gear and talk about traumatic brain injury. Uh, we got funded for this thing, and we realized, once again, as with most of these things, there was no good model to test traumatic brain injury. Uh, any intervention that can make a difference. So the first challenge that we had was to create a model of traumatic brain injury. And it's nice to be in Boston because right across Charles River is MIT and there's somebody there who can make a tool for you. So we found this guy who was doing his uh, PhD uh, on composition of different materials and how they respond to kinetic energy. So you know, why don't you make a, a prototype machine for TBI, which he did. He got all this data out of it, got his PhD. We got a beautiful machine. I'll show you a picture of that. And we took that machine and we created a model uh, where we can test interventions for traumatic brain injury. And it's very difficult. In, a, you know, in rats, you can create traumatic brain injury, but in a large animal model, to create traumatic brain injury that's reproducible and precise, it's extremely difficult, especially pigs. They've got thick skull. So this is what the animals look like. It looks like an ICU. The head is fixed on a, on a frame. Uh, all kinds of monitors, Lycox and so on and so forth. This is our device. It's on a frame. It can be pivoted, precisely put in through tiny craniotomy. And, uh, Ready? Go. Yeah. Whoa. All right. So it doesn't look all that much, but um, if you combine it with, um, with hemorrhage, I'll show you some slides of what injury is. It's like, you know, how do you measure it? I mean, this is what the injury looks like when you take the brain out. But how do you quantify it? So we came, we designed these titanium brain molds. We can get five millimeter slices. It's almost like a CT scan. You can get coronal and sagittal sections, and you can measure the size of the lesion. And this is what it looks like. So that little bonk on the head combined with hemorrhage creates this injury, resuscitated with normal saline. If you resuscitate with hextan, you decrease the, uh, the swelling, but nothing happens to the injury. You give them early FFP, both the swelling and the lesion size goes down. Next question, I, maybe you guys are wondering, what if we give them the, uh, the, the uh, valproic acid? It's even better. Um, we're presenting that the Western trauma. If you just throw in, and again, the problem with the FFP is, again, you can't take it pre-hospital. But Hextend, you can take pre-hospitals, so is the BPA. If you combine them, it is amazingly effective in decreasing the, uh, the lesion size and the swelling after this traumatic brain injury. And this is just the start. We, uh, uh, we wrote up a grant. Army funded it, I think, for about $4.8 million, a five-year project. We're going to look at a variety of different interventions for traumatic brain injury. All that is good, but once you've lost so much blood that you arrest, none of these things are going to work. So we opened the chest up. We pumped the heart. Only 7% all comers that live. Um, usually, this is how it ends up. Um, it's a big mess. So we came up with this idea, Peter came up with it. The first pig that we did together, we, we cooled it down. I said, this is the completely crazy idea, but it took off. That was my first R01 grant uh, NIH funded. And we proposed this idea of not trying to fix the injury, but cooling the entire system down. So it buys you time. The total uh, brain ischemia time, warm ischemia time is five minutes or four minutes. After that, the brain is dead, even if you get the heart back. But if I rapidly cool the body down, not try to fix the injury, but cool it down. You can extend that five minute window into about a two to three hour window. There are a lot of injuries you can fix in two to three hours. And reality is not as, as calm. I mean, it's much more messy. But we've now done about, I think, 20 or 25 studies looking at this whole concept of uh, suspended animation, profound hypothermia, uh, biological arrest where you can fix the system. Um, it, so we, we did all these studies originally, and, and the animals lived. Peter came up with this uh, modified glasocoma scale for looking at pigs' neurological status, whether the tongue is straight, whether the tail is straight, the eyes are OK. <laughs> and, and they looked OK. Six weeks later, we looked at the brains. The brain looked OK. So when we started publishing the data, the, uh, 
the criticism we got from the reviewers, like, how do you know they're smart? I was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, isn't it good to be alive and walking around? I said, no, no, but how do you know they're smart? So we sat around, it's like, how do we check the pigs are smart or not? Uh, we realized pigs have got ex excellent color perception. Dogs don't have it, pigs do. They love food, so we came up with this concept of um, uh, operant conditioning where we presented them food in different color-coded boxes. They all had food, but only the blue box could be opened up. And we designed this composite score. You let them into a room, the boxes are arranged in different fashion. They had to come and find the blue box and not waste time with the other boxes. They can smell food in all three, but the other two are latched, the secret latch in there. It's amazing. I mean, I could not teach, I had a, a, a golden retriever at that time. I could not teach the dog to do anything. These pigs, within two days, you can teach them. They'll come in and, and do all this stuff. So we train animals beforehand, then we put them in suspended animation, no heartbeat, no EEG, looked like a dead animal in a, in, a, in a butcher shop for two hours, brought him back and tested him to see whether they remembered stuff or not, and they did. Then we trained them afterwards to see whether the acquiring new skill is, is intact or not, and it did. So if the clips work, I'll show you this thing. Um, this is the animal now coming in to find the, the, uh, the food. So looks at all the boxes, smells it but doesn't try to open it. There's food in there but doesn't try to waste time. Looking for the blue box. Oh, no, that's not the one. So here's my blue box. Flips it open. Now, you want to make sure that they're not doing it just because it's always in the corner. So you change the position. Now comes in, surveys the room, goes straight to the blue box, opens it, gets the food. I mean, we did that every day. Every day for years. Um, we had a huge colony of pigs. We were videotaping him, doing all the stuff to look at the cognitive function. And, and I mean, I developed a totally new appreciation for how smart of an animal a uh, pig is. So the sum total of all that whole five years of NIH funding stuff was that, yes, we can do it. Uh, if you have to induce this state of suspended animation, you have to do it really, really fast. The core cooling has to be two degrees per minute. Only way you can do that is intravascular cooling uh, on a roller pump to about a depth of about 10 degrees. Rate of rewarming has to be slower. Uh, we can do it easily to 60 minutes. Five minutes to 60 minutes is a huge leap, but near 100% survival. You can take it up to about 120 minutes of full arrest and still have about a 50 to 75% survival. And it works in polytrauma, bowel injury, splenic injury. Once you reverse and back up, the coagulopathy goes away. And not only there is an immediate advantage, but days on, there is survival advantage because your, uh, your gene transcription and your protein activation is all reprogrammed. Like the other st uh, stories that I told you, this again uh, got funded. You see the uh, University of Arizona here uh, because of Peter Rhee um, for, um, so it's FDA approved now. The logistics of launching it are, are, are formidable. I mean, and not just because of the waiver of informed consent, because whoever would qualify for this trial would not be able to give consent for that. So I think the first uh, few patients that will enroll would be in, in Baltimore, and then we'll see how that goes. So the FDA wants to look at the first, uh, it's a 50 patient trial, but they want to look at the first five patient and first 10 patient data uh, before we go ahead. But once again, from a completely crazy idea in pigs to a clinical trial. So uh, we'll wrap things here, and this, I showed you this schematic of goals of trauma care, and if you think more sort of aggressively and outside the box, instead of the, the conventional things we were doing, now we have clinical trials for pro-survival drugs, we have a clinical trial for, for uh, freeze-dried plasma, all suitable for pre-hospital use. And if they still have fixable injuries, uh, you can cool them down. The, uh, uh, the EPR is the new CPR. Um, uh, and it's, it's not limited to this thing, and I, I chose these four or five things just to make a point um, that what may be crazy today uh, may not be crazy tomorrow, and if it's crazy enough, then somebody will fund it. Um, so there is always um, a, a challenge taking a crazy idea, finding funding, but it's an extremely gratifying process because you, you, you see an idea mature into a concept that's tangible, um, generating the data, publishing it, watching your own academic career uh, grow with that, and then uh, having some saved lives at the end of it. Uh, so I'll be uh, happy to answer any questions if you have any questions about any of this stuff.
think for Peter, so uh, he had to go to the legislature in, in Phoenix. So, um, yes, Dr. Rila. Hi, congratulations, Oscar, for and. Uh,